Morning, everybody. How are we doing today? It's uh, Tuesday here in the American Upper Midwest. <clears throat> it's a mild day outside. We're going to have some melting snow today. Uh, let's just first say thoughts and prayers for all my friends in the Ukraine, friends in Russia. Uh, innocence is, ends up suffering on both sides of these things. Uh, <clears throat> the orchestrations of the elite don't reveal the impulses and thoughts of the of the of the masses. Uh, the masses are often brainwashed into following along, but it doesn't mean they're not innocent on many levels on both sides of these type of things. So your heart just goes up for everyone who's at risk, who's involved. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, my history lessons will tell me that greed is at the bottom of all of this. And uh, <clears throat> I just, I'm just going to leave it at that. It's just, it's just sad, you know, that money and the manu maneuverings and manipulations of global economics and uh, <clears throat> the, the manufacture of control over global regions and economics. It's just <clears throat> the truth that we're given is a slice to manipulate our perceptions and, and to garner our support or to prevent us from questioning. But uh, I don't know. I know like I said, I, I'm far from having the answers or understanding all of it. It's just history says that at the end of the day, the rich will be left standing and will have made billions, trillions, depending on the scale, the outcome of this, you know. Uh, secondly, I want to say a prayer for the people in Australia. Uh, much love to all my Australian friends. You people in Queensland, south of Brisbane, uh, even I guess parts of Brisbane are getting some flooding. Uh, I heard they got a year's worth of rain in four days. Uh, you just, you're just starting to hear more and more about these climactic outbursts that are 100-year events happening. <laughs> well, well, more frequently than that, you know. Uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, I don't want to say a sign of the times. That sounds kind of apocalyptic, but... Uh, it's just the obviously the warning signs of a weather patterns and systems that have more energy from more warmer temperatures. There's really little irony or debate or complication to it. It's fairly simple. You add more energy, more heat, even a few degrees makes a massive difference in, in atmospheric climatic conditions. And uh, <clears throat> we're seeing some incredible flooding in Vancouver, but not, not Vancouver, British Columbia. In the interior, uh, <clears throat> that's I think I think it's finally starting to kind of revert back to normal. But without question, there's a lot of really crazy weather phenomena that's happening. It just kind of makes <clears throat> you raise your head and go, "Man, <clears throat> a how can you be a denier? How can you recognize that some of the things we're seeing we have not seen? You live 30, 40 years of your lifetime, and that none of this stuff happens. Also, in the last 15, as climate experts predicted, we're seeing crazy phenomenon." On a regular basis. So anyway, thoughts and prayers for our, our friends in Australia, our friends in Eastern Europe, and uh, our friends in Russia, man. It's, it's not good business for anybody to have to live in fear, to have to live in conflict. Uh, like I said, my parents came from the Second World War, escaped to Canada, essentially, uh, especially my dad from Holland, almost like economic refugees. It was uh, all they lost a lot during the war. And they restarted in Canada for the most part. <clears throat> My mom was from England but, and was born at the heel of the war in 45. And uh, my grandparents on both sides. Uh, I could see as a young child speaking with them. And I haven't had any of my grandparents in decades. They were all, uh, for the while, I think my longest was my dad, my mom's dad, who lived till I was about maybe 15. So they were all, <clears throat> it takes years off your life, you know. It takes years off your life, that experience, that terror, that... And I remember talking to um, my mother's mom the most, Olive, and uh, just the pall of white that would wash across her, her choking on her words and her not really wanting to speak about it. You know, it, it, was, it left an impression on me as a young kid. And then reading the Reader's Digest of the stories of the Canadian boys in World War One, Vimy Ridge, World War Two. Belgium and Holland, those stories in those magazines as a kid, 
the Merchant Marine, <clears throat> they left an indelible mark on me. And I can't watch a war film and not be anxious, unhappy. And it's just, I can't watch it. It, it, it agitates my soul. <clears throat> I can't really even, I can watch war documentaries to some degree, but I still come out of it just like, how stupid are we to allow ourselves to be manipulated and to allow ourselves to be divided from my fellow brethren just from the simple fact he's across the border or a line. It's, <laughs> and even now in America, it's going to be interesting seeing how all this stuff was politicized and how everything is spun back to us. You know, obviously we have that with everything from COVID to climate change to Russian, there's their parts of the right are, are supporting Putin, parts of the left. It, it's what a mess. What a mess. Anyway, you just got to, I just had to mention that. So uh, we're going to get back to jazz right now. <clears throat> uh, things are good. Uh, I, I'm picking up a little part-time work with my brother. You know, it's only about 10, 15 hours a week, but it'll help a little bit. So that's good. Uh, I'll be a little less available to respond and chat with people, but there's still plenty of hours in the day to do that. Uh, I appreciate everyone who does respond to messages and comments on the videos. Um, stuff's good for the channel from what I understand. And boy, I wish I was better at knowing all the metrics and stuff because I'm, it's not the part I pay much attention to. The, the nuts and bolts of it. And there's things you can do to help your channel grow. And I, I look at that stuff and it's just so dry. I'm like, ugh, I can't focus on it. And, uh, so anyway, the people who do comment, appreciate that. I, I do hear it's very helpful. Uh, thumbs up, like if you enjoy the content. And subscribe if you haven't. Uh, Jazz, what a wonderful thing. We've been going through the Prestige label. And Prestige is kind of the little sister to Blue Note in a way. In New York, the late 50s in the early 60s, mid 60s. And they really cross reference each other in many ways from the musicians <clears throat> to the same producers and studios, uh, some of the same graphic design. And they certainly cover, copied Read Miles of Blue Note at Prestige with the graphic design on a lot of their covers. Uh, it's the, the innovations in jazz, those ripples are felt across the industry. And especially at your crosstown rival label, as it were, when hard bop becomes a thing, both labels have to kind of embrace it as we move into the more modern sounds and the edges of the avant-garde and the, the boogaloo and the soul jazz. The labels are all kind of mirroring each other. And unlike a blue note where so much of the more interesting stuff and the, and the soul jazz stuff, by interesting, it's be more complex, more composed and arranged versus the guys who are playing more straight blues and soul jazz. It was all just still put Blue Note, Blue Note, Blue Note, Blue Note. At Prestige, as I mentioned a couple times, New Jazz was the sequence they created to start putting some of the more modern edges of the music on that sequence. And we covered the first 32 episodes on the last one, and uh, my phone ran out of memory because I make too many episodes and don't delete them very often. And it was already about 30-some minutes long, so I'm like, okay, well, I'll just leave it there. You know, I was supposed to do the first 50 We'll jump into the next little section here in a second. Uh, it's a pretty impressive run here at New Jazz. And again, it's just prestige stuff, which is confusing to early collectors because the different labels, a different logo. It's like, this isn't the same as prestige, but it absolutely is. And <clears throat> it's on par in a lot of ways with all the edges of Blue Note at the same time. And for, for reference sake, uh, Savoy's kind of winding up its run here in 1960, where we're about in that era. Uh, Press Impulse, that famous label that everyone thinks is so groundbreaking and trendsetting, hasn't even been launched till late 61 for the Christmas season when the first four releases come out. So Impulse will just be starting to come on the scene here as we're starting to go through this next run of records at New Jazz. Uh, of course, like I said, Blue Note's very much in the same place in 59, 60, 61 with the same mix and same sounds and same innovations. Uh, Blue Note Harbach was always a bit more aggressive and, and focused than if anything Prestige really does, but Prestige is on par in most other aspects. Uh, Riverside, of course, is going to be doing pretty much the same thing also in New York at that time. Atlantic's going strong. Uh, Ray Charles is about to kind of break for them, pushing them more into the 8000 sequence, which is their pop R&B sequence. And their jazz sequence, which is the 1200 sequence, which felt like in the early days was more the more important sequence to them, uh, it starts to become much more uh, R&B edges. And then 
some soul jazz of stuff, of course. But it seems to take kind of a back seat to the 8,000 stuff because there's a lot of great soul R&B happening on Atlantic Records as early as 58, 59, 60. Going into the 60s, R&B really takes over Atlantic's focus energy. And it also takes over the lion's share of sales and consumer interest. So Atlantic's not being stupid by doing it. They're just following the obvious arc of the music itself. Whereas, and again, Prestige and Blue Note are also doing soul jazz, which is kind of also acknowledging where the music's going. Sadly, Riverside loses its way in 62 when uh, Bill Grower dies suddenly, and Ori Keep News can't really keep the label going. Uh, Bethlehem, by this point, has been sold to King. So that great run of Bethlehem Records, that's all 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, it starts to slow down. 58, 59, it starts to really, they're, they're unstable financially. And they have King out of Cincinnati buy them and distribute them. But that ends up changing Gus Wilde's control and what's getting recorded. And a lot of what comes out on Bethlehem Post, that sale, is actually King Jazz stuff. Some of it was in the vault, some of it was already issued on the King label, being repackaged and put out on Bethlehem like it's new Bethlehem material when it's generally not. Uh, and the later you get into that Bethlehem sequence, the 6,000 sequence, the more that becomes the case. It's stuff that King has bought from other labels, stuff that King's already put out. Uh, Bethlehem kind of stops recording with its lineups and it's that stable musicians they have in the mid 50s. It's not present on any of that 1960, 61 Bethlehem material. So you're seeing a lot of changes happen in the industry. And right now, Blue Note, Prestige, and Riverside 1960 are as much the focus of the jazz industry as they've ever been. Okay, so they've kind of ascended to that place where this is the sound right now. This is modernity and jazz. This is when these labels really mattered the most. That run probably goes, you could really extend it from 55 to 65, but by impulse coming in in 60, 61, 62, they've changed the focus. Uh, Creed Taylor goes to Verve in 61. And Verve becomes a much more accessible, commercialized aspect of jazz, changing the focus of the consumer and what's making the charts and what people are voting for as, as hip. And so the elements that make up these great labels right now, they're only the preeminent sound and voice of jazz in this moment. And so when you're talking the history of jazz, 20s, 30s, and 40s, these labels don't even really exist. Uh, Blue Note comes along in like 39 but it's not anything like what it is in, in 1960. And so even in the early 50s, it takes labels like uh, Blue Note and Prestige and Riverside a while to really start garnering uh, the, the artists they want to, and to find their own sound and to be at the cutting edge of what jazz was and what, was, what it was doing. Because that cutting edge, you can't just create it. It's gotta be kind of a natural progression and having at your fingertips the right musicians to capture it, which involves a certain degree of the new young youth. You know, what Norman Grant was doing at Verve was never going to capture that next sound because he was capturing all the old players from the swing era, doing a stripped down, smaller version of swing in the blues in these small, small group contexts. And it's amazing stuff. I love all that Norman Grant stuff. It's incredible but it's not gonna capture the cutting edge of jazz. And so this is the moment when Prestige and Blue Note and Riverside are most prominent, most important. And at, to still give more, even more perspective, <clears throat> there's still a very small percentage of the jazz landscape in terms of commercial sales. They're more distributed now than they were saying at the end of the 10 inch era, 55, 56. Blue Note in those 1500 sequence years was very poorly distributed. You know, not nationwide by any means. Urban centers, black neighborhoods, you know, or, you know, college areas perhaps. But again, college areas are gonna be more, more buying the white labels. The stuff that Bethlehem was doing, uh, the West Coast contemporary stuff was very popular in the college scenes. Uh, Dave Brubeck was up at Columbia by now doing all the colleges, getting big attention, making cool jazz come to the forefront. And Brubeck in a lot of ways kind of does define that cool jazz sound along with <clears throat> other elements that were happening on the West Coast, like Chico Hamilton's early groups. Those were pretty cool, bordering on the third stream. 
MJQ was having some crossover success at Atlantic. Again, doing that third stream sound where they're, they're merging the European sounds of classical in with jazz, which to the average consumer, what, they, what they're what they hearing, <clears throat> Alpha becomes quite removed from the heart and soul of jazz and the blues. You know, a lot of stuff that makes it very popular has some of the essence stripped from it. In order for it to get there, uh, that doesn't make it less than music. It's just, I think a lot of us come into music and the jazz and the things we hear first, sketches of Spain, Dave Brubeck Quartet, uh, the j modern jazz quartet, these things that make us think that jazz is something much more European in its scope. That's a mistake we all make, I think, coming in. We think we just listen to more Miles Davis, Porgy and Bess, and we're like, oh, jazz has a lot of this going on. And that was very much a departure from jazz, that stuff. Uh, the third stream because it's melding that classical European sound and composition into it and arrangement, it was given that title because it wasn't just jazz anymore. It was a bridged mixture of something. Uh, even cool jazz, it was a, a, a deviation. Avant-garde was a deviation. So, so many of us, when we come into jazz and are beginning to comprehend it, our scope and perspective of what jazz is is actually kind of broader in a way than what jazz is in its essence. Sketches of Spain is a poor example of jazz. It's a great record. It's a great example of good music, but it's got a dovetail sound going on with a lot of Latin European sounds or traditions that pull it away from being just a jazz record. And the only thing jazzy about it for the most part is Miles Davis improvisations. The record doesn't swing in a jazz sense. It doesn't have the blues present in very much of its content. Uh, you can, of course, always bend a few notes and have a few things that feel bluesy. You know, I was listening to Big Mars last night from Motley Crue. Shot. You hear how much blues kind of was in his playing, some sliding and some uh, just the riffs. Uh, not, I never thought he was a great guitar player, but hearing him playing live in, in the recent years, actually, I was amazed at how much kind of blues feel and gutsy just kind of riffing and feel. It wasn't his playing, which... In a jazz context, I appreciate appreciate that more than virtuosity. It gave me a new appreciation of McMars, which is a strange thing to even be talking about right now. I do want to mention one more thing real quick. Uh, I've been listening to the new Tears for Fears record a lot. Gotta say, I love it. I just love it. I love the melancholy. I love the maturity. The production's fantastic. The songwriting's great. The lyrics, uh, that Rivers of Mercy song, how can you not, as we get older in your life, want to be bathed in the river of mercy? Because we all know we've done some awful things and made some big mistakes in our life. Things that people we've hurt, exes that we've done things we shouldn't have said or done or cheated on. Or We all have these things with our children, with our parents, with choices we've made in our life. And so when he's, he's pleading for that river of mercy to kind of cover him, it's almost in an essence like, looking for that forgiveness, knowing, man, it's, it's going to take a lot of understanding on someone's part to allow them to make amends with me and all my mistakes. And so the, that record has a lot of that kind of, the, the title track referencing the passing of Roland Arzabal's wife. Uh, it's just, it's haunting stuff with great production, great melody. Uh, cheers to dear, Tears for Fears. I, I've not been able to stop listening to it upstairs on my TV, just watching the different videos and uh, the, the song for, oh, it's, it's a cool video. Uh, it has a lot of modern stuff going on in it with, with the current events in the world. You just can feel uh, no little thing, no small thing, I think it's called. Some really cool stuff. Anyway, let's move on to new jazz. Again, we've got 32 or 33 in the bag. So let's pick up from where we left off, guys. I apologize for the long monologue there, but I haven't really had a chance to monologue much lately because we've been doing these series, so I guess it had to be done. Uh, Benny Golson, 8235, uh, Gone with Golson. Again, a Japanese pressing. Again, a very expensive, very rare record. I don't know if OJC did that one for some reason. You think OJC would have jumped on the Benny Golson, Gigi Grice stuff, but I don't think I've seen any of the Grice, maybe one of the Golsons as OJC. And if their OJC didn't release it, it just drives up the demand so much because they become so rare. 
This is Outward Bound by the great Eric Dolphy. Uh, Dolphy is one of the most interesting players in jazz at this era, or really in any era. Uh, he plays a multitude of different instruments. A brilliant angle seer. He sees the colors and the angles really interestingly. Uh, he has an interesting legacy coming up on the West Coast, but really diving into the avant-garde with Mingus and uh, a lot of the things that start happening for him. Uh, he passes away way too young, makes a great record for Blue Note. Uh, most of the stuff that Prestige puts out of his, most of it's live stuff because there wasn't a lot of recording sessions done. Uh, a lot of it's in Europe too, just because he was over there being appreciated. He uh, moved there, spent the last, he went, I think he went on a tour with Mingus to Europe and uh, memory serves, he decided he wanted to stay and record some over there and then he, he passes away suddenly. It was a great loss for Jazz, and really it was a, he was a new voice that was going to bring a modernity, but there was always kind of a sense of uh, purpose and uh, composition that was going to resolve itself. He, he didn't leave it hanging like some of the guys on that, that stuff do. This is 8237, King Curtis, the new scene. Uh, another Texas tenorman, a real bold sound. Uh, he plays with a lot of rhythm and blues. He played in some rhythm and blues organizations over the years. He might have been with a robotic for me if I remember. I can't remember. But he played in the R&B scene quite a lot. But he also crossed over into the jazz scene, working with guys like Oliver Nelson. Uh, again, the rhythm and blues and jazz are very interchangeable at this point. And uh, he has quite a big reputation in the kind of chitlin circuit, dance circuit. Uh, his music was very danceable. And it's going to be less so here at New Jazz than some of the stuff he does on the other labels he records for. This stuff more ends up being the R&B side of things more often than not. But uh, great record and really tough to find. Soul Nick, Doug Watkins. This is an American pressing a status version. Talk about a tough record to come by. Uh, I think I got that 10 years ago for 50 bucks being a status. And it's hard to find that now for under 100, 200 bucks. Uh, Yusuf Latif is on there. Uh, just... Excellent modern jazz from this era. Blue note quality in every aspect. Uh, Lem's beat, Lem Winchester. Uh, Lem's a great vibraphonist, as we mentioned last time. He was, he was a cop. Uh, he dies too young from a gun accident. But he was just a great modern player. He wasn't like a Bobby Hutcherson where he was pushing the envelope necessarily with composition and arrangement. He was more of a guy rooted in the blues, rooted in a certain amount of virtuosity. He was a great player. But... Uh, we don't really know where Lem would have gone. We lost him too quickly. But uh, great talent. And just to hear him uh, emote over that instrument, you know, that's what the great virtuosos can do is they can emote over an instrument but keep it a narrative, keep it a storytelling, and not make it just about a series of notes that lack meaning or purpose. Modern Jazz Disciples, this is their second record, 8240. Uh, again, it's a group out of Cincinnati, if I remember. Again, it's quite uh, rhythm and blues meets hard bop kind of edges right there. Uh, more rhythm and blues than the, than the jazz messengers. Uh, but they're solid, solid pocket players. And that's black urban music right there from 1960. That's uh, that crossover as that next generation is coming up stuck between jazz and, and rhythm and blues. And they're right there with that whole dynamic. 8241 is the great Johnny Hammond Smith. Talk that talk. Uh, just, again, a great organ player. Uh, and Oliver Nelson guests on that. Interesting thing about Johnny Hammond Smith is he ends up inheriting Jimmy Smith's guitar player, Thornell Schwartz. And so Schwartz plays with Jimmy Smith, and then he moves on to Johnny Hammond Smith. So Schwartz plays with two of the greatest organ players. And then he goes on to play with a few other guys in the 70s uh, and late 60s as, as, a, as a guitar organ combo. Schwartz is a great player who kind of gets overlooked. If you have a chance to get Thornell Schwartz's record at Argo, that's a great record. Uh, Impressions of Mal Waldron Trio, and you might say that's really tough to see, and it is really tough to see. It's on black pa you know, paper with, uh, it's a little better there, it's, but it's the Mal Waldron Trio. Uh, nice kind of, Mal's a little bit more composition driven than a guy like a Red Garland. This is Addison Farmer and Al Heath on the drums from the great Heath brothers. Uh, Waldron's an interesting player, though, and he plays with some of Monk's uh, blockiness at times, an inter interesting approach to rhythm. 
But for the most part, he's just kind of a dark, melancholic player who a lot of people really gravitate towards. Uh, Oliver Nelson screaming the blues. This is Oliver still when he's the majority of a player and less of the arranger that he's going to become. Uh, but those Oliver Nelson records are like, it's, it's great to hear him in the 50s because you know what he does in the 60s with all the at, at impulse and verve, all that big arrangement stuff. And to hear him playing in a more stripped down live setting without all that orchestration behind it, it's, it's just interesting to hear his roots in that sense. Uh, another Opus Lem Winchester. This is the original pressing of that, 8244. It's actually a status LP. I forgot about that. It's a mixed match cover there, I think. Great little uh, Hank. Hank Jones is on there along with Frank West uh, and two of my favorite players. I love Hank Jones. Everybody knows. And Frank West is, of course, one of the great uh, instruments behind the Basie group in the 60s. And just a great composer and arranger. Plays the flute, plays the sax. Uh, and he's on a lot of records. And he has a lot as a leader as well. Uh, just Us, the Roy Haynes Trio. Uh, it's another great record. Uh, it's a cool cover. I'm trying to remember, is Phineas Newborn still in this group? It's Roy Haynes with Richard Wines on the piano and Eddie DeHaas on the bass. So it's quite different than uh, that last Roy Haynes trio record with Chambers and Phineas. Uh, Happenings, the G.G. Grice Quintet, another Japanese pressing. A very rare record with Richard Williams, Julian Yule, Richard Wayans and Granville, Mickey Roker. So some crossover between those two records. But yeah, that's a really tough record to come by. And like I said, all the G.G. Grice stuff here on New Jazz is some of the toughest stuff to get from the Prestige label. Ken McIntyre, uh, looking ahead, uh, he's got a record on United Artists that I have not been able to get. Iron Sheep, I think it's called. I've been trying to buy it, but it's always so expensive. Right now, I don't have the money to be buying anything. But uh, 8247... Eric Dolphy appears on this, which actually drives the cost of that record up quite a lot. Uh, you can see Dolphy there pictured with McIntyre. McIntyre's an alto player, and he's also on the edges of the avant-garde. And they can actually get pretty out at times, some of Dolphy and Ken McIntyre's work. This is Benny Golson, and I can't remember what it's called, and I can't read it. Oh, uh, getting into it or something like that is probably me. This is what you want to say on here. Getting with it. That's what it was. Getting with it. Uh, Golson here is playing with some of his alumni from the Argo uh, band that he plays with for a long time, the Jazz Tet. You got Curtis Fuller, Tommy Flanagan, Dougie Watkins, and Art Taylor. Again, just great modern hard bop. Golson's a Philadelphian. He plays with Coltrane and his band as, at a younger age. So he's been around the Lee Morgans. Golson's a fiery little guy who can really push the boundaries of his horn, but also of just dynamic and composition, a lot of feel. <clears throat> Gotta always dig Benny Golson's work. Testifying Larry Young. Uh, this is the Larry Young Trio, 8249. And again, Larry Young's stuff probably could have been put in the Prestige series, but uh, some of what they, some of the choices they made, Weinstock, with where records ended up, it's not crystal clear as what they're doing. Forest Fire, the great Jimmy Forrest, another guy who plays with Basie for a while, a very forceful uh, tenor player. He uh, makes a couple records at, at uh, the Delmark label in Chicago. you got to love Jimmy Forrest. He's just one of those great players, kind of like a Frank Foster. And once you get into it, you just be like, man, this guy's just telling me stories. Some Gene Ammons in the sound. Uh, this is the Latin Jazz Quintet with Eric Dolphy, 8251. Again, a very rare record, a Japanese pressing. Uh, the Japanese often just went with the Prestige logo for a lot of these new jazz titles, which again could be confusing to young collectors. But again, new jazz is just, you know, maybe it's even something as simple as a tax haven. You have the second imprint to, the, to, to divide up your business and revenues. Out there, Eric Dolphy, a uh, pretty famous artist, does a lot of these covers for him here. Profit, something, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, cool art. Kind of describes the, the feel of where Dolphy's modernity is heading. And I think he had a pretty big impact on Mingus even, even though he was quite a bit younger than Mingus. 
Dolphy was just a, a guy that pushed the parameters. And of course, he also worked with Coltrane on Africa Brass. And so Dolphy's impact, though short career-wise, is was a long. His impact is still felt, I would say. Uh, Jackie McLean, a long drink of the blues, eighty-two fifty-three. Uh, again, Matt McLean stuff here, or I prestige. There's not really a change in the sound whatsoever. So they could have been on either sequence. It would seem like, but uh, they they chose to mix it up. Or maybe once they launched the new jazz, they just wanted to keep enough titles on this side of the fence. This is Walt Dickerson, and Walt Dickerson is another great vibraphonist that they bring into the fold here. Uh, this is 8254, and you can see in that label there, it even says Prestige New Jazz 8254. So they're actually acknowledging on that cover that it's the same thing, guys. Just don't worry about it. There's that lovely old New Jazz label. Uh, like Lem Winchester, Walt Dickerson was a great player. Probably a little bit more of a romantic a little bit more, uh, a little bit less of a virtuoso, a little bit more of the blues, a little bit more of the gospel in the black church. Uh, big Walt Dickerson fan. Uh, straight ahead, Oliver Nelson with Eric Dolphy. And I think there's another guy that Dolphy had an impact on was Oliver Nelson because Oliver Nelson starts making records uh, like uh, his big record at Impulse in 1960 when this is right before that, if I remember correctly. And so, uh, the moment of truth. What's that record called? Oh my goodness, starting a blank. But uh, it's like the number fifth or sixth record in the Impulse canon. I'll just have to look real quick. Impulse is right here. Uh, the blues and the abstract truth. Uh, Dolphy had a big impact on that record, and here you see them working together. Uh, it's just a great impact by a great young mind. That's how you describe Eric Dolphy. Uh, Jackie Byard, a great piano player. I think he also played with Mingus, if I remember briefly. Uh, he had some stuff that actually kind of went near out, but he was also a fairly straightforward player at times. Uh, Don Ellis, New Ideas. Uh, this is actually the prestige cover of this, because it came out at 7607 as a prestige title, which is years after it's new jazz release in 1960 as 8257. But uh, that's how I found it affordably, and that's how I grabbed it. Uh, I have, I'll, I'll probably buy the new jazz title that if I ever find the cover affordably enough at some point. It's been a while, so I haven't bought a record since October. I bought the new Tears for Fridge the other day finally, but that's, that's the only thing I've bought recently. Uh, early, art, early Art, Art Farmer, 8258. And this is with Sonny Rollins and Horace Silver and Winton Kelly. And this is stuff that comes out from before Farmer's Market. It's early stuff. Uh, it might have been issued briefly on 10-inch or something. But uh, some of it, I think, was not issued at all. Uh, but it's great early, modern, hard bop, post bop. It's, it's not quite hard bop, but it's, it's definitely post bebop. Here's Ken McIntyre's second record, Stone Blues. A great uh, set of songs. Uh, I don't think Dolphy's on this one. No, Dizzy Saul, Paul Morrison, Bobby Ward, and Johnny Mancebo Lewis on the trombone. But uh, again, it's new jazz. It's that same thing like what you have in Blue Note at this point. Some interesting records by people you don't know that are going to be hard driving, uh, interesting compositions. Eric Dolphy, Volume 1, Live at the Five Spot. And again, Dolphy's body of work here is going to have a lot of live material. Uh, Eddie Blackwell, Richard Davis, Mal Waldron with the great Booker Little. And for all the interesting and composition and soundscape that Dolphy can bring to a setting, Booker Little brings fire. Booker Little was, he replaced Clifford Brown in the Max Roach group. Uh, Booker Little can play. He's a virtuoso of the highest level. Clean, bright tone like a Clifford Brown or a Freddie Hubbard. One of the greatest technicians that we saw on the trumpet. Uh, just a, We lost him so young. We lost him like at 22. He came from Memphis with, along with the other guys from that area. Uh, just a great voice. That Too bad we didn't get more Booker Little. Uh, this is Yusef Latif, The Sounds of Yusef. Uh, this had a double release, a 7122 Prestige. 
It was also released as 8261 New Jazz. And I'm pretty sure this is the New Jazz version. It is. Uh, Yusef stuff has gotten very expensive this last 10 years. This stuff used to be fairly reasonable. And then Gigi Grice featuring Richard Williams, the Rat Race Blues, 8262. That's another rare, rare record. And that's a beautiful old pressing of that. The Rat Race Blues. So that brings us up to 8262. And I have every title up to that point in New Jazz. And then uh, we'll dive into what's coming next right away here. Okay, so the first record I'm missing here is uh, Young Blues by Larry Young, 8264. And I just haven't found it affordably yet. And I guess I'm not buying records at the present. But it's something I plan to fill in. 8265 is Ron Carter's first record uh, under his own name. And it's with Eric Dolphy, Mal Waldron, some fairly broad sounds and edges. Uh, I think this is part of what helps Carter prepare for playing with Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock. It just kind of pushes Carter's boundaries out pretty quickly. 8266, I'm also missing that one. And it's the music of Abdul Malik. Another record I need to grab at some point has that same kind of cover theme that they've changed to here. Here's uh, Roland Alexander, a great player on the saxophone uh, with Marcus Belgrave. Kind of a new young wave of cats starting to show up here. Uh, the new sound was starting to take off. Then there's another Walt Dickerson record, which I don't have. Uh, I've been around a few times, but I haven't managed to win it. 8269 is Mal Waldron's The Quest with Eric Dolphy and Booker Little. So that same band is all getting turns as leaders recording together, and they're doing some pretty interesting uh, towards the edges of the music stuff. Uh, again, there's some titles missing here. Uh, there's a Jackie Byer, Ron Carter record called High Fly. Dizzy Reese, Asia Minor. I've not managed to pick that up yet. Then I have another good stretch here of Yusuf Latif into something with a really beat up album cover, sadly. Um, but Walt Dickerson, Relativity. That's his third. I'm missing his second. Uh, Kenny Burrell and John Coltrane. Uh, interesting stuff that they recorded together back in 58. That's got another cover as well, if I remember. It might actually be on Prestige as well. I can't recall. Uh, this is Red Garland with Curtis Fuller. That's a great session. Tough to find. 8277. Uh, 8280 is Zut Sims. Good old Zut. And that's definitely stuff that was from back in the early 50s, if I recall. Um, I'm missing in there a work of art and 4, 5, and 6 by Art Farmer and Jackie McLean. And again, that's this stuff that was reissued on the Prestige early back in the mid-50s. Uh, Bossa Nova Carnival is next. And it's a wonderful record here by the vibraphonist Dave Pike. Pike was an interesting player. Uh, he kind of crossed a lot of boundaries. Uh, his record on Atlantic, the Jet Set, uh, the Jet Set Age, or the Jet Set, that record's really collectible. I think in part because of the cover, but uh, good stuff. Uh, 82 82, Abdul Malik's second record, The Sounds of Africa. Uh, a great bass player. He also played some uh, other stringed instruments. Uh, he was doing kind of what Youssef was doing, where he's bringing world sounds into jazz. And uh, was a fairly well reputed player at the time. But his career never really took off. Uh, Dave Pike, Limbo, Carnival, his second record here at New Jazz. Uh, those records can go for pretty decent money. Uh, there's another Walt Dickerson record in there that I don't have. I think I'm missing two or three of his records. Uh, Cracklin, Roy Haynes with Booker Irvin. And this might be Booker Irvin's initial appearance at Prestige New Jazz. I can't remember for sure. But uh, he ends up making a great string of records for Prestige late in the 60s, mid-60s to late 60s. And you'd think those would be on New Jazz, but it feels like New Jazz was getting kind of phased out by this point. Even when they started doing these album covers, it seems like New Jazz is starting to become... Oh, yeah, this one has a cover in the sequence. It feels like New Jazz is kind of winding down at this point already. And it feels like stuff that's coming out now is kind of just... Uh, let's just put it on the new jazz sequence. And uh, it's starting to not no longer be this kind of split thing. So the Booker Irvin stuff does end up in the 7,000 sequence. 
Roy Haynes Symbolism, 8287, one of the great drummers of that era, uh, 8288. Johnny Hammond Smith with the great Selden Powell, who was a great swing player, uh, plays the blues really with a lot of guts and bravado. Uh, his work on a Roost label is fantastic and to be looked for. Jimmy Forrest, Soul Street. Uh, Forrest has work on Prestige and on New Jazz. Uh, that one took me a while to track down. Uh, they, he does Experiment and Terror on here, which is a great uh, so, so, soundtrack track by Henry Mancini for the film of the same name, Experiment and Terror. And I've always loved that song. The film is pretty good, too. It's a noir film, I think in San Francisco, if I remember, in the 50s. But uh, this version of Experiment and Terror is just fantastic. It's something I've played in gigs before. Uh, 8296, Trumpet Giants, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, and Fats Navarro. Again, that's just stuff they packaged to capitalize on Miles' success at Columbia. Let's put out some Miles here, making people think it's something different. Uh, My Fair Lady, 8315, uh, just a compilation piece. So you can see New Jazz is really kind of wandering away. The Dealers, Mal Waldron with John Coltrane, Jackie McLean, Paul Kinoche, and Frank West, and I've done some research on that record. I feel like there needs to be an earlier version of that because it's from 57, and maybe it's just kind of scraps. With that lineup, you think it would be uh, a more prestigious session that they would have wanted. To, yeah, it's from two different sessions, it looks like. But uh, you think this record would have had an earlier release and an earlier promotion with those names on it, but i am not really seen it outside of that status pressing. And most of the status pressings do get new jazz numbers. Even if they were prestige titles originally, it seems like. Maybe not. I'm not sure. Uh, 8309 is Zut Sims, Coco, with Phil Woods and John Eardley. And this is originally 7033 on prestige. So that wraps up the new jazz sequence from, of what I got. All right, so again, there's a few other titles here that I don't have. Like the Pony Pondexter plays the big ones from 63, Evening in Casablanca by Art Farmer, which is actually just a release of 7017, uh, Jackie McLean's Steeplechase, which is a release of 7068, uh, there's a Phil Woods Pot Pie, which is a reissue of early 50s stuff, uh, Jazz Soul of Cleopatra is just a compilation, uh, the soul, the new jazz number sequence goes up all the way to 8327, that Wheeling and Dealing Coltrane record, which I already showed you in the Prestige sequence. This is the last one, it looks like. and uh, But most of these later titles are all reissues of stuff. It looks like they're just kind of being tacked on at the end. And the, the, the new stuff's kind of disappeared by this point. So when you're talking new jazz, you're really talking those first uh, 60, 70 titles. And then after that, there's still some great stuff, but it becomes a little bit more sporadic. And then... Uh, it pretty much all goes back to the main 7,000 sequence at that point, which continues on up until 1970 or so when they change all the numbers again. I think in the next episode, we'll go through real quick Moodsville and Swingsville because people seem to want to see those again. And they're worth seeing. 